Well, welcome everyone to a uh, second in the series of this uh, global webinars on the international system of power. And as you know, the idea behind this particular series, this global webinar series, which Javaria Jaffrey, who will be online on the line in a moment to introduce all the speakers. Uh, what we're really trying to do is trying to get a kind of what we've been talking about, which is a kind of global conversation based on global knowledge, on big international questions and on the system of power. Now, it's quite a, an open question as to what exactly global knowledge is, if it exists. But I think the way we understand it, it, it certainly is a process whereby we try to lower the boundaries and barriers to entry into a conversation about some big interesting questions, such that anyone who is serious, who does research, who has got something to contribute to our understanding about big world issues and uh, institutions is enabled entry and it, to engage in a debate and an exchange, which the hope is that we get the kind of people who would not necessarily normally be on the same panel at a conference or sit in the same kind of room. They may have theoretical, uh, methodological kind of uh, differences, as well as being globally located uh, far and wide and that the idea is to put those sort of people in the same room uh, for a, an hour or two in order to kind of get to the bottom of a big question. And that's what we want to try to do. And the hope is, I think, is that through that process over weeks and so on, as the series progresses, that we actually move from just hearing differences, but to seeing whether there may be the possibility of integrating ideas and knowledge, connecting ideas and knowledge, such that it actually impacts not only our knowledge, but our understanding of how things work as well. So it's really, it's trying to sort of suggest that there can be a democratic forum, an egalitarian forum for debate and discussion. So that's the kind of aim. And the idea then is to move to maybe publishing some working papers based on the talks which are given. Um, for today's one is obviously on the United Nations. We will be, we are recording these videos and we're making those uh, widely available. And we're also thinking about how we might uh, be able to podcast the same uh, if we can actually manage the technology adequately. And I'm really glad to say that we've got uh, the backing at the moment of four uh, institutions, obviously City University's Department of International Politics, uh, but also LSE Ideas, LSE's Foreign Policy Think Tank, uh, the OPEU INU group in Brazil, which is the primary uh, scholarly society for the study of the politics, history, and political economy of the United States, as well as the Miami Institute for the Social Sciences, whose principal purpose is really to look at the kind of uh, global north, global south intellectual networks and linkages and so on, and try to sort of connect them uh, but also to kind of give a platform to global South thinkers and social scientific thinking from that zone. And uh, we're really pleased to be uh, working with the Miami Institute as well. And from next week, I'm very pleased to say that the University of West London, which is not possibly quite as exotic as the other institutions I've mentioned, have also kindly agreed to support the series and to bring their scholars and students into the kind of network and the process and the conversation as well. So um, with all that, um, uh, I would just like to ask Javaria, the co-chair, to uh, introduce the panelists uh, for this afternoon. You're muted, Javaria. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Indrajit. I'll just introduce them in alphabetical order if that's okay. So we have with us today, Dr. Jasmine Ghani, who is a senior lecturer in the School of International Relations and Associate Director. Sorry, she's also Associate um, Director of the Center for Syrian Studies, uh, both at the University of St. Andrews. And her research supervision and teaching focus is on the history of European and US empires in the Middle East and Asia, ideologies and social movements in the Middle East and anti and decolonial political terms. She has a PhD degree from the London School of Economics, and she is the author of The Role of Ideology in Syrian US Relations. She's also the co-editor of the Routledge Handbook on the Middle East and North Africa State System, 
Uh, she has a forthcoming volume on the Syrian uprisings, actors and dynamics in the middle phase of the conflict. We also have with us today, Dr. Kareem Magdisi, who is Associate Professor of International Politics and also the Director of the Graduate Program in Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut. He's an affiliated scholar in the Critical Securities Research Program at the Arab Council for the Social Sciences as well. And his recent publications include edited volumes, uh, including The Land of the Blue Helmets, United Nations in the Arab World, um, also between regional autom autonomy and intervention, new conflict dynamics in the Middle East and North Africa, and also interventions in conflict, which is um, um, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2016. And we also have with us Dr. Daust Schoenberg, who is uh, from City University. He is lecturer in international relations in the Department of International Politics. And his recent publications include the Scandinavian International Society, Primary Institutions and Binding Forces, also published by Routledge. He's also uh, done work on international institutions in world history, divorcing international relations from the stage and stage models. And with Barry Bazan, he's worked on Global International Society, a new framework for analysis published in 2018 by the Cambridge University Press. His research interests are in disarmament and armed forces international theory, and he works on the English school approach to IR. So thank you for joining us, everyone. It's uh, Karim to, to start, please. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just um, share the screen. Yeah, are you able to see this? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Indrajit and Javaria, for for inviting me uh, to this uh, to this excellent series and this panel series. Um, I'm really honored to be part of of this uh, this particular panel and this series, which I think is is really interesting, both in in terms of the concept of what you're trying to do and how you're reaching out to the different institutions across uh, across the globe and the global south. So I really appreciate uh, all your work, Indrajit. So I thought um, you, you had, Indrajit had asked me to, to maybe in, in my short presentation, just talk a little bit about, uh, on the one hand, some basic, my sort of basic ideas of how to think, how I've been thinking about the UN uh, in the Arab world. My sort of the, the basic impulse, the basic uh, inspirations and, and, um, and maybe approaches that, uh, that inspire the kind of work that I've been working on for the past several years. Uh, and it then try as much as possible to get a little bit more specifically into my uh, ongoing book project on, in fact, on Lebanon, on Southern Lebanon and the, the role of the UN in particular uh, in that area. And I don't know if I'm gonna succeed in putting these together, but I'm going to try. So I thought, um, I, thought uh, I, I would start just, just by briefly uh, talking a little bit about where my interest from the UN comes from and it comes a long way. Uh, anybody who lives in, in Lebanon or lived in Lebanon or grew up in Lebanon would know that the UN is all around us. It's always around us, it's ever present. Uh, there is no keeping it. Um, the, the, uh, the UN peacekeeping force that's been in Southern Lebanon is almost as old as I am. So there's, it, it's the kind of visibility of the UN is everywhere in Lebanon. Second and you know, more importantly that as, as with many Arabs, uh, the loss of Palestine uh, and the Nakba was a central concern to me, both personally and, and research-wise. Uh, the UN, of course, has played the role of a midwife to the creation of an Israeli state, but it also has, since the 1960s and 70s, also served as a central international forum for the contestation of Israel's occupation and apartheid-like grip, as well as the guarantor for Palestinian refugees and, and the, the right of return. Um, I'm just going to go to the second slide here. 
think um, Karim's internet connection seems to have frozen temporarily. I'm sure it'll be restore itself in a moment. So we can just uh, try to be a little bit patient. He had warned earlier about the electricity power cuts, which were kind of ongoing problem in Lebanon, actually, and the internet connection as well. So it looks like he's probably sort of had to log out and is going to try to come back in. Welcome back. You're muted, uh, Karim. I, I apologize again, but the Wi-Fi keeps cutting here in Beirut, so uh, I do apologize. Um, so I was saying that the third is the question of Palestine and uh, the question of the global struggle from the global south, uh, in particular, um, tracking how effectively the UN in that sense kind of mirrors the, the shift in international politics uh, across, across the globe. And finally, my interest is, um, was stoked even more so when I, after the first job, after I, after my PhD, I worked at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQA, which is the, the regional commission based actually here in Beirut. Uh, and as I was there, I witnessed in a sense quite, quite intimately um, how this building, which is in the heart of Beirut, it's a glass building right in the central part of Beirut, uh, um, sort of began to get enclosed as uh, after September 11, 2001 attacks, the second Palestinian Intifada, and then mostly the Iraq War of 2003, uh, when there was both the staff inside ESQA itself, and that's, they were mostly Arabs, although they're international staff, but they're mostly Arabs, uh, the way in which the reaction was from the inside, but also the outside as the UN building, this glass building, transparent building, uh, had increasingly more guards around it. First, just basic guards. Then, you know, as by a year or two after that, there was the entire army, the half of downtown Beirut was closed down. And so it became really quite symbolic of the way in which the UN increasingly lost standing and stature. Uh, I, I, at least that's my argument in the, in the Arab world. So I think this, is, um, th this, is, this, was, this was important for me and it was important for me to see the practice of this UN as I was working from within those, uh, within the ESCO itself. So these, these brief uh, personal reflections, I think try to set up for me in my thinking about the UN, two or three broad points that I think uh, many scholars in the region, uh, perhaps larger global South confront when thinking about and contesting the kind of knowledge production, let's say in, in international relations and in researching the UN itself. First, I would say is that studying uh, the UN and the struggles it embodies is often a lived experience with much at stake, not just an academic one. So the insecurity and security we feel does not go top, does not gel very well with top-down approaches embodied in mainstream international relations theories uh, that gives agencies, of course, to the big powers. So as uh, together with some colleagues in the critical studies, critical security studies program and the Arab Council for the Social Sciences, the idea that we have is to be part of an effort to explore how insecurities are experienced by various state and non-state actors in the Arab world and how local and regional conceptions of insecurity are often at odds with those embedded and enforced by the international community and so-called international community. Uh, in that sense, our research draws on local readings and counter discourses narratives to explore the limits of Western dominated institutions and security. Uh, in the sense, this echoes what scholars in the post colonial tradition, such as Mira uh, Sabaratnam and others, who call for uh, going simply beyond the local or the everyday turn in studying international interventions and insist instead on taking seriously the subject of such intervention, their interpretations and experiences rather than those of the kind of outside experts and bureaucrats and you know, aid industry and others like this. Uh, of course, more broadly, my work builds on uh, uh, scholars in the critical theory uh, tradition and, and more recently in the kind of critical constructivist scholars such as uh, Sharia and others, uh, including those who work in the global IR field such as Pinar Bilgen and, uh, and others who kind of encourage us to think beyond Eurocentric terms. So I think this is all very important. A second broad point that I wanted to raise was, which of course it seems self-evident, um, that critical and historical approaches are essential 
to the understanding of IR and in our case, the, the United Nations. So such historicizing requires not just interdisciplinary approaches and methods, but bringing in area studies as central to our research approach. Uh, scholars specifically working on IR of the Middle East, most notably such as uh, Baghdad Qurani of the American University in Cairo, for instance, have long called for bringing in area studies into the mainstream of, of IR, uh, given as Louise Fassett has said that, quote, the IR of the region, like its politics, stubbornly resists generalization. Uh, Qurani himself has critiqued IR and social scientists in general who, quote, developed their universally applicable theories on law-like generalizations without feeling a need to visit or even consult basic books about any of the world regions to which they believe their insights apply. Uh, it mo more recently, in fact, just a few months ago, uh, Andrew Hurrell at Oxford uh, argued that without a sensitivity to area studies, academic IR cannot deliver on its promise to provide a satisfactory historical account of how global international society evolved, nor an adequate analytical account of its dynamics, nor a plausible normative account how it might be reformed and restructured. So, uh, you know, of course, all of this is part of the decolonizing of the IR in which, uh, you know, it's, it's really important to just recognize that area studies needs to take that central location, um, certainly when we're looking at the United Nations. Um, so the third kind of broad point that I wanted to make is that the kind of key concepts, the key IR concepts that, that we often kind of look at in, this, in these areas uh, need to be problematized. They're always kind of problematized. And of course, uh, I mean, I have a whole other presentation, which I certainly won't have time now to get into, but sort of looking at the history of the UN as it goes from its creation uh, through the Cold War and the post-Cold War and then the kind of post-war and terror periods. But the idea is to, is to challenge the way in which terms like sovereignty are presented in this mainstream literature, uh, the, this kind of realist versus liberal institutionalist approaches within IR, and to try to figure out uh, how it is that these concepts of sovereignty viewed from below, let's say, are, are, are much more dynamic than is often presented in the, in the research and in the, in the IR uh, literature, at least the mainstream IR literature. Um, there's, 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 a, there's a number of, of theorists and, and scholars that have worked on, on such issues that we take uh, uh, inspiration from. Uh, for instance, Richard Falk has, in, within his own kind of scope of critical constructivism, uh, talks a lot about this, this notion of legitimacy struggles and the idea of trying to uh, look at the United Nations not so much as one of simply great power politics, but one in which their struggles from below can manifest itself through ways in which these narratives try to compete within the UN itself, within the narrative, within the discourse of the UN, to try to uh, uh, it sort of come out on top. And he uses, of course, the question of Palestine and the Arab-Israeli conflict, especially Palestine itself, as a kind of key contributor to this idea of what he calls the legitimacy wars or struggles over legitimacy, uh, kind of making the point that the, while the power politics of the United States and the Israelis uh, often tends to win out, it's, it's the, those uh, uh, kind of uh, supporters of Palestine and the, and the cause of Palestine that have uh, over the decades won out in the international legal realm at the United Nations and others. And so the question is, how does that happen and why does that happen? Uh, what Falk is unable to do, of course, from his viewpoint is to try to then go a little bit further and deeper into the, into the more regional and local understandings of how this gets problematized. Uh, so, of course, there's, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more um, that, that I could talk about here, and maybe in the discussion, uh, this could come out and be, um, be something of interest. So, to get to segue a little bit into my own kind of research, um, if I can, if my presentation is still, can you still see my presentation, Indrajit? Uh, no, it uh, disappeared earlier Oh, it on. disappeared. Okay, yeah. it disappeared. So... Okay, I think you can see it now, maybe? Yes, can see it, thank you. Okay, so I, I'm not, you know, there's the, the question of, of, um, of my research on, on Lebanon. So I look, I have a, I have a, a kind of, I was um, running at the American University of Beirut, a kind of research program 
uh, on the United Nations and the Arab world. And that's what produced this edited volume in the end with uh, Vijay Prashad on the Blue Helmet, the UN and the Arab world. Uh, and a lot of this, of course, looks into the historical approaches and focuses on, in particular, the Arab-Israeli dimension when it comes to the Cold War period. And then in the post-Cold War period, there's a lot of discussion, especially about Iraq, which really comes to the fore uh, of, of, uh, of the UN relations in the Arab world. My, what, I, what I more specifically have been looking at from my own research is the contest uh, within South Lebanon and trying to see how it is that this has uh, manifested itself within the debates uh, at the United Nations and with all the plethora of UN resolutions that, that have passed over many decades uh, over this question of Southern Lebanon. So I know there's not too much time um, and I want to just maybe you know, get to some of the core arguments and the core points that I'm trying to make here. So the core point is, is trying to, as, as I'll try to show, is to try to look at these UN resolutions over a span of three or four decades in order to show within this context of Southern Lebanon, which itself is part of this larger Arab-Israeli conflict, how it is that the shift in this UN, in, in the discourse and in the narratives that UN resolutions seem to adopt, or at least that I argue are adopting, reflects a, a real shift in international politics. So uh, perhaps just as a, as a kind of quick background into, into the complexities of Southern Lebanon, and uh, those of you that know a bit of Lebanon know that, that it's, it's very complex and very difficult to try to, to, try to talk about it briefly, but um, the idea behind South Lebanon itself in a sense mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, I'll put here very quickly, uh, in southern Lebanon in particular, is that it was the venue for um, one of the most heated parts of this uh, in sort of post-1967, post-early 1970s Arab-Israeli conflict. So it was a battleground where the Palestinian fighters, the Fedayeen, the, the, the PLO fighters, uh, were fighting their war of liberation from southern Lebanon from the 1970s onwards until their expulsion in 1982. And at the same time, after 1982, when the Palestinians were expelled from southern Lebanon, a more native Lebanese resistance emerged, um, including the communist parties, leftist party, nationalist parties, and eventually, of course, Hezbollah is the one that, that comes to dominate in southern Lebanon and becomes the kind of most effective resistance that continues until uh, this very day. So that really starts in the 1980s and then in the 1990s especially. And the idea is that um, when the Israelis first, the first major Israeli invasion is in 1978 of Southern Lebanon. And so they occupy Southern Lebanon and um, immediately the UN Security Council meets and passes a resolution in order to get the Israelis to withdraw from Southern Lebanon. So they pass a resolution this resolution is really quite a, a short resolution. It simply says this is illegal, basically, and Israel needs to withdraw immediately from all occupied southern uh, Lebanon. Now, it, so it clearly reflects the standing of the UN and the understanding of what was permissible and what was not permissible in terms of the uh, in terms of the Israelis. The Israelis made it very clear at that point that there was. I don't know if I'm still on. Yes, slightly breaking up a bit, volume-wise. He's, he's gone. I think, yeah, uh, yeah his internet has clearly disappeared again. And one of the vagaries of um, living in Lebanon, I think uh, Karim was telling us earlier on. So I think we'd be happy to be patient uh, with him. He'll be back in a moment. <laughs> 
Yeah, so meanwhile, um, to keep us entertained, um, colleagues and students and uh, others in the audience, if you want to have any, uh, ask any questions, just click the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type them in. And then at the, at the Q&A point, we can begin uh, to kind of collate the questions and, and, um, and allow them to be answered and so on. So please do press the Q&A button to do so. Thank you. Apologies, everyone. Um, we'll give give uh, Karim another minute or so, and then we see what happens. And if he's not back by then, then I think we can perhaps move to Jasmine, um, and then. Indrajit, you're on mute. Sorry, yeah, my the pressure of my hand on my space bar <laughs> clearly not enough. Need to do some more weight training in future. Um, yeah, so what I was saying was, sorry, uh, is if Karim doesn't come back in the next minute or so, perhaps we could go to Jasmine um, and then give Karim some time after after Laust has uh, done his presentation. And that might be uh, kind of the best way forward. Uh, it doesn't look like Karim is going to return soon. Um, so Jasmine, I would you be happy to... Yeah, please step in. I'm sorry. Uh, just it, it is what it is, isn't it? Of course, yeah. Um, but um, so please, if you want to share your screen. Yes, thank you. Um, I think Tanya, are you um, is Tanya controlling the screen share on this? I'm just share. trying to bring that up now for you. Um, Okay, great. Great. Um, yeah, you could go to slide share so the whole screen comes up. Perfect, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you to um, Indajit and uh, Juvaria for inviting me and um, Tanya and the whole team as well um, for working on the logistics of this. Um, and in many ways, uh, Kareem actually set the stage quite nicely for my presentation. As he mentioned, there is some overlap. And I think with the rest of Kareem's presentation, he would have focused on um, the United Nations engagement with the Lebanese issue. So my presentation focuses, it does look at the Arab-Israeli conflict, but much more on central, the central issue of um, Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, first slide. Uh, the next slide, um, Tanya, please. Thank you. Um, so the, oh, no, the first one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the key arguments I want to make or the contentions I want to put forward is I'm thinking about the title of um, this particular session. Um, what is the role of the United Nations? Um, and is it an instrument or a tool of um, metropolitan control, great power control? Um, and I suppose, uh, looking at the structure of the United Nations from its inception, clearly there is, that is an intention um, in the minds of the great powers, um, especially with the United States, we see that it's, it, it does um, play a role in legitimizing great power interests under this guise of collective ratification. And especially when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict, if we look at the dates, um, the first um, convening of the United Nations and the first resolutions that are passed are in 1946, but those are really dominated by administrative issues, also some humanitarian assistance issues, looking at the, the question of food supplies um, in countries that were affected by the Second World War. But the first concrete set of resolutions about a dispute between different nations, different people, is actually with regards to the Arab-Israeli conflict. So in many ways, thinking about conflict resolution, the Arab-Israeli conflict is um, 
it, it's the model on which the United, uh, United Nations bases its, its um, future resolutions, it's, it provides a precedent. Um, so in terms of the UN's coercive instruments, obviously, and we all know this, only the great powers have access um, really to, the, to, to that by their veto rights and permanent membership of Security Council. Security Council has selected members that rotate, except for the P5, um, and only the Security Council's resolutions are binding on all members of the United Nations uh, and requires unanimity. So obviously that puts a lot of emphasis on the, the veto and the capacity for those great powers to, to block any um, resolutions, whereas the United Nations General Assembly, uh, Assembly resolutions are not binding, only need over half of the votes to pass. Um, so given the great powers or imperial powers or hegemons, however we want to describe them, their domination of the Security Council, it's very clear from the beginning where power lies in quite a hierarchical system in the United Nations. Having said that, the point I want to make in my presentation is that it's not so straightforward. And actually, there's a lot of space for contestation, especially of legitimacy, even if um, some of the, the weaker states or the global south um, don't really have the material military capacity, the coercive capacities that the Security Council has, um, they tend to dominate the General Assembly. And that does play a role in terms of thinking about um, global norms and also stripping of legitimacy from the great powers. So if we look at in the early years, um, the United Nations is instrumentalized, first of all, by the British. So the British has uh, commands a mandate over Palestine, which it has since um, its ratification, the League of Nations after the First World War, um, and increasingly unable to control um, the escalating situation in Mandate Palestine between the, the Zionist movement and the Palestinians. Um, it uses the United Nations to cast off responsibility. There's this great, great quotation of one of the British delegates to the General Assembly saying, we have tried for years to solve the problem of Palestine. Having failed so far, we now bring it to the United Nations in the hope that it can succeed where we have not. So Britain pretty much is, uh, seeks to um, move on from its failure by just handing the issue over to the United Nations. So that's the first example of instrumentalization and, and seeking to redeem itself just by engaging, absorbing itself in the General Assembly um, without taking responsibility for the issue. The next uh, most important um, date and resolution with regards to the Arab-Israeli conflict is the United Nations Resolution 181 in 1947, which is the partition of, of Mandate Palestine. Um, that's the image that you see on the left, um, the sort of turquoise um, uh, uh, area is designated to be a future state of Israel and the orangish area for Palestine, but Jerusalem, in, importantly, is an international zone. Now, neither the Zionist movement, um, so this is before the establishment of Israel, so that's the most appropriate way to describe um, the movement, neither the Zionist movement nor the Palestinians nor the surrounding Arab states are willing to accept the partition plan. So it's not actually accepted by anyone, but when it becomes apparent that the Arab states are opposed to it, the Zionist movement see the merits of advocating for the partition plan. Um, and so the United States comes in behind um, the, the Zionist movement in support of, quite strongly in support of the partition plan. Now, often we might think that the United Nations is a site of um, disagreements between the, the emerging superpowers and the Cold War after the, first, after the Second World War, but actually a lot of people forget that the first state to recognize Israel once it declared its independence unilaterally in, in 1948 was not the United States, but was in fact the, the Soviet Union. And so what you see is actually there's a lot of consensus between the two superpowers when it comes to the specific issue of Israeli statehood, um, and for example, we see uh, the United States is very clear in, in not particularly supporting Palestinian aspirations for statehood right from the start. But the Soviet Union also retained this ambiguity right up until today, in fact. So you don't really see much disagreement. Um, there's pretty much a consensus between the great powers. Britain pretty much takes a backstage um, in the early phase. Um, and so what you also see in terms of the instrumentalization of the United Nations um, is a way of derogating responsibility when it comes to the issue of Palestinian um, refugees. So you have the creation in 1950 to 1951 of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees um, in the Middle East. Initially, this did have a protective mechanism as well um, for Palestinian refugees, but it's stripped of that and through sort of various bureaucratic maneuvers, um, the, the bodies that are designed were created to deal with the Palestinian issue um, are split into at least three, four different categories that each of them, um, they have overlapping um, roles. 
um, or they are incapacitated because there might be a particular area that they need to be, want to be able to provide protective mechanisms to the Palestinians, but they can't actually fulfill that because it belongs to another body. So this derogation of the Palestinian issue away from a political one to, to purely being a humanitarian issue where UNRWA is only really able to provide humanitarian assistance, but no um, political protection is another example uh, in which the United Nations is instrumentalized by the great powers in so far as there are certain responsibilities that they no longer are required to, to shoulder um, over an issue that is deemed too controversial or might upset their allies. In this case, the United States would upset their Israeli allies. Okay, so um, if we can move to, oh, just one final thing to say here. It's of course, once you have the establishment of the United Nations and to have a voice at the United Nations, you have to have possession of a state, then in many ways, actually, there's the um, centrality of the UN as a site to negotiate these issues means that the Palestinian voice and representat representation is automatically by default erased. Um, they are represented uh, increasingly um, by the Jordanian delegation, but of course the Jordanians uh, demonstrate that they, they have their own problems demographically in terms of Palestinian interests in Jordan. Um, so you have uh, an erasure of the Palestinian voice with the establishment of the United Nations and the shift of the conflict to the UN. Um, if you can, if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to think of a, of a parallel event um, to understand what happens. And, and actually Kareem talked about a shift in norms at the United Nations and it would have been wonderful to hear um, how he developed that argument. I hope we still get a chance to hear that. But I'm, I'm, I want to think a bit about Bandung in 1955. So this was a really momentous event for the global South or um, as it was known, previously is that the third world movement, the emergence of this movement of um, newly decolonized states who precisely recognized um, the, the hegemonic designs um, in the United Nations um, through their bilateral relations as well with, with their former colonizers. And so developing this increased solidarity, transnational solidarity um, within the global south. And I, there's a lot of work um, by post-colonial um, scholars and historians um, yeah, so, sorry, London um, sound effects. So there's a lot of work by post-colonial scholars um, on the importance of Bandung and the need to actually take uh, its role into greater consideration, the development of um, norms, the development of international relations, um, giving it greater primacy. But I'm surprised that there hasn't been more done to look at the impact of Bandung and the solidarity that emerges from that amongst the anti-colonial global South states um, in organizations such as the United Nations. And there is some work done, but it's not, there's not this explicit connection made. Now, I'm not saying that Bandung provides an alternative to the United Nations for the Global South. What I think we see is that the, the coordination that is stimulated by Bandung then is reflected in their coordination of third world countries in the United Nations. And it's here that you start to see an increased divide between the role of the United Nations General Assembly, um, which is not, you know, its resolutions are not binding, um, but nevertheless, you know, the majority, all of the other, all of the states in the United Nations are represented there, and it's easier to pass a resolution because it can't be vetoed, and you just need to have um, above fifty percent majority. Um, except in particularly controversial issues where you have to have a two thirds majority, a divide between the General Assembly and the United Nations um, Security Council. So that hierarchical structure is still there, but I think you can see that the Global South recognizes the way that they can also instrumentalize the United Nations. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. That's a bit small, the writing. I hope you can read it. So I... Um, went through every single one of the um, United Nations General Assembly resolutions with regards to the Arab-Israeli conflict from 1947 to 2018. Um, there's about 191 to 195 resolutions. Um, and I then looked at the discourse, um, the wording, what the resolutions were concerned with. 
And you can see between 1947, um, when you have the first resolution on the Arab-Israeli conflict up until 1955, so up until Bandung, um, you, the majority of those resolutions um, pertaining to the conflict are about the international status of Jerusalem, the importance of protecting the international status of Jerusalem. Um, there are a couple with regards to the setting up of UNRWA. Um, and then there are a couple, so there are a few also relating to the need for um, the Near East countries to come to the negotiating table. Um, but they're relatively neutral. But after 1955, I think you can see a shift. Now, the numbers I've provided here, um, the, the primary concerns of the General Assembly are quite apparent. The majority of resolutions are with regards to Palestinian refugees and explicitly about the need to protect Palestinian refugees, to provide assistance to Palestinian refugees, to ensure the right of return of Palestinian refugees. Um, the next, uh, so the next type of resolution um, that follows, uh, highest in number, is condemnation of Israeli aggression or a demand for investigation into Israeli actions that affect the human rights of those in the occupied territories, i.e. Palestinians, or after 1967, we're talking about other Arab territories like in the Golan Heights. Um, so there seems to emerge this pattern where it's clearly in the General Assembly is clearly producing resolutions that are representing or reflecting Palestinian Arab interests. And um, we do also have resolutions reiterating Arab sovereignty over occupied territories, especially after the 1967 war. Um, after 1980, you have the first time that the UN General Assembly actually calls for a Palestinian state, and that increases in frequency. Before that, you have a couple of examples where it calls for the PLO to have membership of the United Nations, challenging that erasure that I talked about right at the beginning, um, and also calling for humanitarian assistance for Palestinians. Um, there are some neutral resolutions about all of the sides coming back to the negotiating table, um, but the others far out, outnumber that. So. Um, in many ways, because there is such a polarization and because it's a sense that the United States and the great powers are so partially in favor of Israel, um, the United Nations becomes a really important site for not just addressing the Arab-Israeli issue, but also globalizing the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, the UN enables um, the Arab-Israeli conflict to be an issue and a site of third world solidarity and resistance. And it reminds me of actually some of the final points that were raised in the previous session last week, uh, Mick, Randy, Leonardo, talking about the creativity of the global south, um, the way in which closed doors actually allows them to think of more subversive ways to, to reflect their agency and their voice. And I think this is one of the ways that we see that happening. Um, so even though the enforcement mechanism of the United Nations is not in the global south's hands, um, it still becomes a venue where they're able to petition um, the hegemonic powers and they're able to quite publicly strip the hegemons of this legitimacy that they're trying to claim through, through a liberal order. Um, if we can go to slide, the next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, as I mentioned, you start to the increased hierarchy and division between the General Assembly and the United Nations Security Council becomes more and more apparent. So then uh, looking at the Security Council, also there's a high number of resolutions passed on the Arab-Israeli conflict, particularly with regards to Israel-Palestine. So in that same period, 191 resolutions are passed. Um, but the language is a lot milder, it's a lot more neutral, the, generally the resolutions are calling for truce, calling for peace, calling for negotiations, but not really holding either side accountable. What uh, you notice though, this really interesting shift after 1967, especially between 1968 to 1974, so this is post 19, the 1967 war when Israel's military superiority is emphatically confirmed. It's also that 1968 it was also the period when the United States um, makes a clear strategic decision that its support for Israel is not just based on um, an identity um, or connection or affinity emotionally, but there's a strategic decision and a rationale behind it because Israel has demonstrated it can act as a, a sort of a military policeman for the United States in the region as well. 
So how is it that despite the United States being so strongly in favor of Israel strategically after 1967, that we start to see in the UN Security Council, this shift in the language where you have increased number of, um, well, the resolutions increasingly use words such as deploring or condemning Israeli actions and explicitly making demands. So this is, this is really interesting, it's fascinating because it doesn't tally with what's happening in US politics and the increase, increased efforts to consolidate Israel's control over the, its annexed territories in the 1967 war. Um, so between 19, um, especially after the 1973 war, you see this shuttle diplomacy um, that uh, Henry Kissinger embarks on between Israel, Jordan, um, Syria and Egypt. And what's fascinating is that this particular period, immediately after 1967, um, Kissinger actually, um, and when he becomes Secretary of State, he advocates a policy to uh, embark on a separate peace, to actually negotiate with the various parties in the Arab-Israeli conflict separately, precisely because when they brought together, the Arab states form a bloc. And this is how he's able to um, bring Egypt on side. Egypt defects from the Arab nationalist cause. Syria is not able to get any of its demands realized because it doesn't have the backup from its allies. It's also able to bring Jordan onto a, a side of neutrality. So the same period where the United Nations Security Council is issuing these resolutions that are producing more strong condemnation of Israel. It's exactly the same period when the United States is conducting its diplomacy away from the United Nations and is embarking on this separate peace policy. Um, let me just see. Okay, so then after, I mean, from there onwards, it's a, it's a policy that the United States has continued up until this day. So every negotiate set of um, negotiations um, with regards to the Arab-Israeli conflict since then, especially those led by the United States, have been off UN premises. So the 1970s disengagement agreements, um, the Camp David Accords, the 1990s Madrid peace talks, um, even though that was more collective um, and it was less uh, partial towards Israel. The Oslo Accords, of course, famously not um, via the United Nations. Um, and we have to ask why, why is that the case? Um, so clearly that instrumentalization um, of the United Nations by the great powers, something has shifted and the great powers, particularly the United States recognizes that actually the United Nations isn't really um, an adequate vehicle um, for pursuing their interests and pursuing the interests of their allies. Um, so hence, they, they take the diplomacy um, off the UN stage. And that's uh, concurrent with the increased instrumentalization of the UN General Assembly by the Global South. And then we can see that since 1970, um, in the early years, the Soviet Union actually used its veto the most to block new member states. Um, but after 1970, the US takes over and uses its veto more than any other state, usually to prevent condemnation of Israel in the Security Council. And that only changed after 2011, when uh, Russia took over and using its veto the highest number of times because of the Syria conflict. So um, if we can go to the final slide, I think that's the final slide. Yeah, yeah. Catherine, you've got about three or four minutes. That's perfect. Yeah, this is the last one. Okay. Um, so if we bring the narrative forward to the 2012 um, General Assembly vote to award um, Palestine a non-member observer state status, we can really see the direction that the General Assembly is moving in. Um, I mean, I put a link there. Uh, I don't know if I, it's about a minute long. I wonder if we can go to it. Um, could we? Uh, it's, it's a perfect ending to my um, presentation. Of course, of course. Thank you. So um, Tanya, if you could click on the link and then click on the video that shows up. I hope this works. Yeah, videos on Zoom don't always work. They don't, they don't cooperate. Maybe we'll forget that then because I'm running out of time. The, the point of the video is a very simple one. It's just about a minute long. It shows um, the UN, uh, United Nations General Assembly waiting for the votes to come in with regards to this non-member observer state status for Palestine. And it's an overwhelming majority in favor of um, awarding them that status. And you have, so I think it's about nine countries that voted against it, obviously the United States being amongst them. And there's this thunderous applause 
um, in support of, of the outcome. And I think it's a very visual example of how the UN General Assembly is this site of contestation over legitimacy, right? Um, in a way that's very, can often be very visual when those votes come in. And the United, of course, does this mean, I mean, my final comments here is, does this mean that the UN is now biased towards Palestine? And these are some of the statements that um, uh, the Israeli government have often issued recently. They said, you know, UNRWA is just, an, it's a, a mechanism to support Palestinian terrorists, for example. Well, no, it's not as straightforward as that. A, it still favors states, right? And there's still an incapacity for the Palestinians to, to represent themselves. It still puts in place a competitive and hierarchical structure. Um, legitimacy is still granted by mirroring the colonial state. Um, it still shifts towards the Israeli position because Israel criticizes um, even the slightest disagreement um, with their interests by the United Nations. And the Security Council is still where coercive power lies. Um, but I would conclude by saying that the UN is um, it's not a monolith. Um, it's not only a site of great power politics, it can be instrumentalized by different sides of the hegemonic uh, divide. So it's not just, um, it's not really a site for peace in the Arab-Israeli conflict, but at the same time, it is a site where the Arab-Israeli conflict has been used by the global south to petition against the hegemonic powers, express their dissatisfaction, um, and to strip um, the, the global north of the former imperial powers of, of legitimacy. Um, and I, yeah, and I think that that ruling in 2012 was interesting because that's what paved the way for the ICC ruling just a few weeks ago. Thank you. That's it. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jasmine. That was wonderfully timed as well and really interesting. And as you said, it picked up on themes which uh, Karim had just kind of begun, uh, provided a platform for, had begun to, um, to sort of develop. And uh, hopefully after Laos, uh, we'll have Karim back. Uh, to kind of complete his uh, complete his presentation, and we can move to the Q and A after that. So, last, thank you very much, um, and over to you. Yeah, thank you, and uh, I would also like to start by uh, by thanking uh, Indigit and, and Jawari for for organizing this whole series, and and also for including me. Um, I'm not going to talk about the the Middle East at any great length. Uh, so uh, this will be a, a global intermezzo uh, on the on the actual organization of of the UN. Um, but um, I'm certain that some of the themes that I'll touch upon uh, can also be related to the Middle East. Um, the topic that I'll uh, talk about is uh, is generally like complete disarmament. So I'm I'm usually uh, categorized as an English school scholar, but you won't really find much about international society in this talk or the English school. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, general and complete uh, disarmament, uh, which is most of you probably know is still the ultimate goal of the uh, UN disarmament efforts. Uh, it was uh, most recently reconfirmed by the Secretary General in uh, his 2008 uh, non-paper uh, securing our common future. And uh, what I want to explore in this talk is the is the paucity of reflection on what could be called the the legal and political architecture of this project of general and complete disarmament since the 1960s. And uh, paucity uh, displayed by policymakers, uh, but also uh, academics to a large extent. And to uh, to do so, uh, I'll first give a, a very brief uh, history of. Uh, general and complete uh, disarmament. Uh, and I'll use the acronym, uh, since we are dealing with disarmament issues, I'll use the acronym uh, GCD, going forward for general and complete disarmament. So I'll briefly give a, a history of how it has been debated uh, in the international community. And then I'll talk about um, how the discussion of uh, GCD by policymakers uh, largely got stuck on the issue of control and verification in the 1960s, uh, and that they really never got to the legal and polit political architecture in any real detail. And then I'll more discuss how uh, academics did explore these issues, uh, legal and political issues in the 1960s, but this debate has uh, also not really moved on since. Uh, and then I'll close my talk with some uh, brief observations about uh, what such contemporary debates about these issues might cover. Uh, 
So uh, briefly, the, the history of, uh, of GCD. Um, so as many of you uh, probably know, it's, it's an idea that was initially associated with, uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, so they put it uh, forward uh, at the World Disarmament uh, Conference in 1932, where it was dismissed very rapidly. Uh, there's a brief prehistory to that. Uh, they actually introduced the idea in the preparatory commission for the disarmament uh, conference in 1927-28. And during those meetings, uh, it was discussed at, at some length, and those debates are, are quite interesting. Um, uh, as an sort of initial window into some of the political uh, positions uh, by the different uh, great powers and also by uh, uh, the Soviet Union. But as I said, uh, the idea was uh, was dismissed quite rapidly at the actual World Disarmament Conference in 1932 and then was only uh, reintroduced again by the Soviet Union in uh, 1959 in the, in the General Assembly. And then it was uh, debated at length in 59 in the uh, first committee uh, dedicated to disarmament and international security. And it actually ended up, um, the, not the proposal as such, but the idea to put, uh, because the Soviet Union uh, did come up with a proposal in 59 also back in, in 32. Um, but the first committee agreed to uh, go forward with the idea uh, if not the, the actual Soviet uh, proposal uh, by unanimous decision in, in 59. And then um, there was uh, negotiations back and forth between um, the Soviet Union and the US in particular. Um, and that led to um, uh, the Cloy Sorin Accords, as, uh, as they're called, uh, or the Agreed Principles of 1961. Uh, setting out sort of the, the core principles that should lead the negotiations, negotiation going forward. And then the actual negotiations were supposed to be um, taken forward in this specific committee that uh, the great powers had set up, uh, a committee outside really of the UN framework. First, it was uh, named the 10 Nation uh, Committee on Disarmament. It had five representatives from, from each military bloc, uh, but then um, subsequently, it uh, morphed into the 18 nation committee on disarmament uh, when uh, eight non-aligned uh, states uh, were uh, allowed to join, uh, partly due to pressure from uh, uh, from uh, the developing uh, developments following uh, Bandung, pressure from the third world and uh, the non-aligned movement. And then they were supposed to negotiate how to realize uh, general and complete uh, disarmament. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, presented a, a proposal uh, for a treaty. Um, the US countered with their own proposal. Um, and then things uh, largely uh, got stuck in the course of the 1960s. Um, they debated at length in the 1818 committee uh, about what to, how to progress with this. Um, uh, but that debate was largely focused on on control issues. Uh, so the the U.S. holding that uh, that the UN and uh, whatever disarmament organization was set up to to monitor disarmament should have full access uh, to uh, to do an inventory of uh, armaments around the world, including in the Soviet Union, um, and then the Soviet Union uh, saying that. Um, um, that could easily lead, lead to espionage and uh, uh, that they wanted uh, control of uh, disarmament, but not um, control of uh, armaments more broadly. So the debates uh, and the negotiations really got stuck in the, in the 1960s. There were certain successes if we think uh, other areas of dis disarmament, the partial test ban treaty, um, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Um, but um, the superpowers and the other members of the committee didn't really move forward with the general and complete disarmament uh, projects. 
Then there were different attempts in the 70s and 80s to revive um, this discussion. And a lot of the impetus came again from the, from the third world and the non-aligned movement. Uh, so uh, I'm talking here about the different special sessions uh, dedicated to disarmament in the General Assembly uh, in 78, in 82 and uh, 1988. Um, scholars and policymakers uh, to some extent agree that um, the first of those special sessions was a success uh, because it helped uh, put disarmament on, uh, on the agenda again um, and um, international society or the member states of the UN were able to uh, agree on a final uh, document. But the subsequent um, um, two uh, special sessions are generally conceived uh, are generally considered to uh, have been failures by and large. Um, um, and um, in the final one, they weren't even uh, able to agree on a, on a final uh, document. And obviously, uh, the record of actual disarmament taking place in the 1980s was uh, was fairly meager, uh, also considering the, the second Cold War, Reagan and, and all of that. So what the policymakers uh, debated in the 1960s, um, as I said before, they were debating stages of disarmament, um, whether to proceed with the uh, nuclear weapons first, or whether to save nuclear weapons for the final stage. They were talking about control and, and verification. They didn't really, as far as I can tell, discuss in any detail uh, the creation of the international police uh, or peace force. Um, that was actually mentioned in the agreed principles between the Soviet Union and the US in 1961, or any of the associated legal and political, uh, political ar architecture that uh, should come with that uh, international police or peace force. So the reform of, uh, of UN institutions and international courts. Now, interestingly, um, these political and legal issues were actually debated by the academic community. And here the, the towering contribution was uh, Gwendolyn Clark and Louis Sohn's uh, book, World Peace Through World Law, uh, with editions in uh, 1958, in uh, 1960 and 1966, um, and translated into a number of, uh, of languages. And in this work, uh, Clark and Sohn, they proposed in detail a fully revised charter for uh, the UN. So article by article, um, and also uh, a number of additional annexes which would create the necessary international police force and associated legal and political institutions to accompany general and complete uh, disarmament. And this book has become a common reference point uh, for academics, but again, interestingly, the conversation has really not moved substantially forward since then, since that book. So for example, uh, there was a book last year published by Cambridge University Press by Lopez Carlos, uh, Claras, uh, Dahl and Groff, uh, entitled Global Governance and the Emergence of Global Institutions for the 21st Century. And here uh, they do little more than, uh, than restate the proposals uh, made by Clark and Sohn and uh, going through um, some of the pretty dismal history of, uh, of disarmament at the UN. Uh, but they don't really add any substantial uh, new ideas is my uh, humble uh, interpretation. Now, one might recently adopt the position that uh, the GCD is a, is a fully utopian proposal that will never find real support amongst uh, the states and peoples of this world. But since GCD is official UN policy. Um, we might at least be expected to think through what realization of GCD entails and the associated political and legal problems. And to me, at least, it makes sense to think through these problems, not from the perspective of the 1960s when a lot of this debate uh, happened, but from the perspective of the conditions prevailing in the world in 2021. So let me just end by uh, providing two brief examples of, uh, of such problems or issues uh, which Clark and Sohn uh, did not consider in their very detailed proposals for, these, uh, uh, for this legal and political architecture to go with uh, GCD. 
So first, they they obviously didn't touch upon responsibility to protect. Uh, that principle wasn't around. Uh, and this principle is is obviously central to contemporary security practices uh, at the United Nations. However, one might start to think about whether it's uh, appropriate to stick with that project of R2P um, if we want to move forward with, um, uh, with the political and legal infrastructure or architecture proposed by Clark and Zoom. Um, perhaps that's not the smartest move um, if uh, we want to get enough states to sign up to uh, some of these proposals um, because uh, they would be concerned about uh, an international police force with real teeth uh, being able to meddle with their in, uh, in their internal affairs. And of course, this is a, a really thorny political and, uh, and ethical question, uh, which I think uh, deserves uh, a lot of debate. The second uh, issue I will mention is that um, Clark and Son thought that it was impossible to move forward with a reformed UN or new parallel peace organization. They also held that out as a distinct possibility that instead of reforming the UN, uh, a, a parallel or entirely new organization could be set up. Uh, but regardless, uh, they thought that it was uh, impossible to move forward with either unless the vast majority of states, including all the great powers signed up. And here I'm also wondering how true uh, that is uh, in the present conditions. Um, is it, for example, possible to imagine using NATO as a vehicle for Clark's and Song's proposals and, and gradually expand it so it includes more and more states? Would it then be possible to get it off the ground without, say, Russia and China, and then bet on these countries being uh, convinced to join down the road. I think that's also something that uh, deserved a, at least a, a little bit of, uh, of reflection. Now, um, I don't have the answers to these questions, uh, but I think those questions should be uh, raised and uh, debated by the international community and uh, particularly by um, states in the global south uh, who were at the forefront of debates about disarmament uh, looking back over the Cold War. And the stakes really are as painfully clear as they were back uh, today, as they were back in the 1960s. Um, we still live with the distinct possibility of the nuclear annihilation of human civilization, the unfathomable resources currently being dedicated to armaments across the world um, are still there. Um, they're higher than uh, when um, the different uh, leaders, world leaders bemoan the, the scale of those resources uh, in, uh, 78 and in 82 and 88. Um, so the problem is definitely still there and um, I think it deserves some serious consideration both by academics and by policymakers. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you so much Laos and um, Jasmine and also Karim. Karim is now with us but has uh, very kindly agreed for us to go to Q&A and uh, as an act of um, to repay his kindness, I'm going to give him the first question, which will allow him to kind of amplify some of his points. And it's um, it's a question from my very good old friend from university days, uh, Mr. Abid Ali, who says, uh, I think directly, largely at Karim, uh, who says, uh, isn't Southern Lebanon's significance to Israel and its continued interest in it, a legacy of the formation of the modern Middle East and its impact on water resources? Isn't Israel still hankering for control of the Natani River? Similarly, the creation of Syria and Iraq intentionally created inherently unstable states where minority sects were left in control of political power over the majority sect. So suitably large questions, um, Karim, which uh, may allow you to expand on some aspects that you would have put into your presentation perhaps. Uh, yes, thank you, Tujit. And again, my apologies to everybody for my dropping out, uh, oh, such as the peril of being in Beirut these days. Um, yes, th those are very broad questions. I, th I thought if I if I can just add one point to sort of, I, I think in a sense to complement um, 
the, the previous presentation by Jasmine as well, which ends on the question of, uh, because I think this, this will connect what I was trying to get out at the end of my own presentation, where she talks about Palestine going to the UN and uh, you know, going through the legitimacy struggles through trying to get its, its, its uh, position as a state and then being denied and then sort of continuing the story. My story was actually quite different, which is that in the, in the, in the ground of South Lebanon, you have the opposite effect. You have a, a resistance force that continued to fight on the ground and that material fighting, the resistance and in a sense successful resistance to the Israelis enabled it to redefine what sovereignty meant in the case of Lebanon, like actually redefine what sovereignty meant in Lebanon. So today in the, in the debates that are even going on right now in Lebanon, there's a lot of uh, you know, political turmoil, but the idea is in a sense, Lebanon is split in two and has been split in two since around that 2005, 2006 period, where you have one contingent and those are those that support, let's say the resistance and the kind of Hezbollah and the, and the resistance who say sovereignty means you need to defend yourself against Israeli aggression. And then you have others, the other side who are against Hezbollah are saying, no, sovereignty simply means you have to go against Hezbollah because they've got weapons that are outside of the state. It's not the Lebanese army. And so you have to dispense with this which is also part of the larger intervention kind of movement that's, that's been uh, pushing through Lebanon. So you have the very understanding of what does sovereignty mean transposed onto these debates in the UN itself through these resolutions that are being produced, where even at the Security Council level, the United States and France at the point were unable to impose a certain understanding of sovereignty, that is to say an anti-Hezbollah, anti-resistance sovereignty, and instead it remained a kind of murky, uh, both narratives embedded into the text of the resolution as sort of, you know, uh, it, it, two sides that are fighting and continue to fight to this day about not just on the ground, but on the very idea of what sovereignty in Lebanon is. And that kicks back to the, to the Security Council. So very different than the Palestine case, where Palestine, because they gave up resistance, in effect, to kind of the armed struggle and resistance, they had to rely purely on the international bodies at the General Assembly, especially General Assembly, which has become uh, quite uh, ineffective over the past 20, 30 years in the post-Cold War period, and basically throws itself at the, uh, at the hands of America. So it's, a, it's an interesting juxtaposition there. I just wanted to kind of bring this up as a, as a way to kind of finish my own uh, presentation there. But in terms of the question, yes, uh, water, I mean, the idea behind the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon goes back a hundred years or so. Uh, and you know there are documents that show fairly clearly that at the time, the, the Zionist movement wanted to uh, have what would have been the border of Palestine all the way up to include Southern Lebanon in order to incorporate the water resources and all of this. And, and of course, many have argued that the occupation of South Lebanon up until the year 2000 was in part security and in part to kind of take the water and the natural resources that are there. But then it became clear that that was not going to work because the resistance was too strong. So they had to leave that area. Uh, the idea of, of the final question about the, the idea of, of the sectarian part in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon, I mean, this is obviously a huge question, but I would say uh, that the way in which the projects of defining sovereignty and power sharing in countries where that have a long history of coexistence, like in, our, in Lebanon, in Syria and Iraq, in, in, in Palestine, all these areas has a very, very long and rich history of coexistence. The modern state system uh, was put on in this kind of by through French and British colonial things was to uh, put it put in power certain sects over other sects like a lot of the kind of post colonial uh, uh, states throughout Africa and Asia. Uh, and what you see, though, is a kind of continuous meddling from the outside to try to disrupt this balance, this, I mean, coexistence and then try to balance them within the state structures themselves. This is being fought from the from the bottom up and from the top down, and uh, uh, and and I think the only way that this works is through a real political process that involves all the different uh, the groups and sects that are in each of these countries. Thank you so much, um, Harim. Um, we got quite a lot of questions, and I'm going to try to be as fair as possible, but at the same time, kind of manage a discussion which kind of is uh, is interesting and continuous. Uh, there's a question for Jasmine, I think where an anonymous uh, attendee asks, is the lack of humanitarian intervention in Israel by the UN a sign of solidarity with Israel through identity? Thanks, thank you. It's an interesting question. Um, 
of course there are some states that um, there's solidarity because of identity with Israel, um, which influences a lack of action. But as I mentioned in my presentation, has been mentioned by others, um, the United Nations has been designed precisely so you, you can't have humanitarian intervention unless you've got the unanimity from the UN Security Council resolution, especially of really controversial issues. I mean, you have peacekeeping missions, but humanitarian intervention itself has is is deliberately something that is um is is less feasible right um the united nations is in terms of its approach to the state and protecting state state sovereignty in that sense it's quite conservative right it's always going to prioritize that that suits a lot of the global south actors as well when they're wanting to use that to um, argue against Western intervention in their countries, and therefore they will turn to the United Nations. That's precisely the reason why the United States didn't want to take the, the question of the Iraq war to the UN um, in, in 2002-2003. Um, so I think you know, the, the way that the UN is set up is to preserve the state, and it's to preserve sovereignty. And so Israel, or the, the movement to establish the Israeli state, is quite smart about that, right? Recognizing hum, hum, human rights, issues of um, you know, liberal issues to do with, with justice, um, with these types of norms is not the priority. Capturing the state is the priority, capturing it by force if, if necessary through the rupture of war and make, making sure that they were able to bandwagon with key allies that would then uphold that sovereignty via the United Nations was paramount. And recognizing that has pretty much ensured there wasn't going to be humanitarian intervention for decades to come. Um, so I think it's, more, it's mainly to do with the, the mechanisms of the United Nations, but also going back to the question of you know, who's providing solidarity to the UN, even in that vote that I mentioned, and those the few states that didn't vote for Palestine to have um, non, it's such a mouthful, non-observer state status, whatever it is. Um, I mean, they uh, even right from the beginning, at the time of the resolution for the partition plan, and um, the, the documents show that there's a lot of lobbying, both from the Israeli side and the Arab states, uh, towards smaller states to get them to vote on, on their side. So sometimes even recently we've seen uh, Israel has been um, demonstrating willingness to, to sell or share excess of the COVID vaccine with countries that haven't been able to, um, to obtain those supplies. And, and so there's a lot of soft power moves, um, uh, efforts to increase trade between countries that still design that, desiring that legitimacy and validation via the United Nations, via international diplomacy, via trade, that Israel is able to use that quite effectively. So there are some states that would vote in favor of Israel because there's something in it for them in terms of their economic interests, or there's something in it for them in terms of the United States conferring that on them. So for example, recently when Morocco um, agreed to um, uh, relinquish its, um, sorry, it, it uh, agreed to relinquish its claims over certain territory in favor of normalizing relations with Israel. That's a classic example of that. Uh, a very, really, really short response to the question that was given, if I may, to, um, or I'll move on perhaps. Indajit, can I respond quickly to yeah, that? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Yeah. go ahead. There's a little, there's a question, I think it was Abid's question. Um, and about Syria and Iraq's formation and deliberately unstable state formations and putting installing elites. Um, of course, the formation of Syria, as with all of those countries, was inherently unstable. But I do want to point out that a country like Syria has been able to use that to its advantage as well. So it has traditionally, under the guise of um, Arab nationalism, has intervened in Lebanon and has had very fluid borders with Iraq, and that suited its interests when it wanted to um, challenge US presence after the Iraq war in Iraq, allowing insurgents to cross those borders. Um, in using that, the argument of we're all sort of one nation, right? So these, these states were installed, and so we don't really respect those borders. Um, and then at that, allowing them to explore their own interests in these countries as a, because they consider it as their own backyard, they've been able to exploit that too. And the other thing about elites, you know, there's this politics, messy politics within these countries. Um, and initially, actually, the governments in Syria, um, they were democratic governments. They were headed by conservative landowning nationalist elites. Um, and the um, Alawi minority was actually able to rise to power by um, capturing the military, and precisely because they have a lower socioeconomic status. And that was the only way they could um, pursue any kind of social mobility. And so through a series of, because of the role of the military and the primacy of the military through the Arab-Israeli conflict, 
they were able to rise to prominence there, um, demonstrate their ideological legitimacy through their role in the, in the military, and then establish power through a coup in 1970. So um, minority rule in Syria is, a, is an interesting case where it wasn't installed by outside powers, but through a socialization process within Syria itself. Right. How interesting. Actually, continuing on the socialization theme, there's two questions which I can wrap up. One from uh, Professor Oz Hassan from Warwick and one from uh, a friend uh, called Alana O'Malley. Uh, Oz asks whether or not the panel think that reform of the UN is possible. And Alana, may, meanwhile, makes a really interesting point that a lot of the global South actors are themselves socialized within the liberal international order, uh, including the United Nations, and that they are elites who are embedded within the international system. So in that context, what would reform really look like? And do these, even these particular global elites or global South elites really want any kind of radical change? Or are they just looking to have their voices at the top table, but are actually quite embedded in the entire system itself? I wonder, Karim, if you might want to have a crack at that. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll try. Um, these, are, these are great questions, of course. Um, I, I look at it in a slightly different way. Of course, the idea of the Global South, I think, has shifted. That's why we looked at, uh, and, and my colleagues also looked at it in this historical way. I think this, you know, the, what the Global South was doing in the 60s and the 70s, imposing a radical uh, uh, you know, resistance challenge, let's say, to the established international political, liberal political and economic order, uh, you know, made it in a way that we can think about the global south in a much more coherent way. Now, of course, you know, you know what is India, what is Brazil these days? Things have, things have, it's, it's not coherent in the way it once was. And of course, the elite are embedded into this larger international economic and, you know, liberal system. Uh, that's why I think it's interesting to look at, I mean, I'm, I'm interested within this, not so much about the reform as such. I'm not sure the UN is reformable in that sense. I mean, it's, it needs to be, of course, it should be expanded. You need to have, you know, countries from the global stuff coming in. I just don't see this happening. I, I just don't see this debate progressing anytime soon. But the question is, what are the, what, what's the relevance of the UN looking forward? Mm -hmm. And what are the various resistances that are going in to try, resi resistances in, in every sense of the word, that are going into trying to change this kind of order, you know, as we move to, uh, this this kind of climate change situation as we go to uh, a potential nuclear, as you're also saying, kind of the, the, the uh, potential nuclear holocaust kind of thing that 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 may be around the corner as well. Uh, pandemics, all of these things. Can the UN be this be this body that can deal with this in a way that is able to respond to these global threats? Not so much who's in charge. They need to remove, I think, the Security Council powers. That would be my my reform kind of suggestion. But more importantly, it's I think the idea is to look at these different resistances and see how do we how do we reform the whole global governance system itself. This is I mean it's I think sure. this needs a lot more discussion. But I'm not sure if I was able to. No, it is it's really tough question. It was a little bit unfair as well. But these are the sort of questions which are arising from our audience. I wonder if we may just swing towards Laust for a moment and Laust. Um, uh, one of my PhD yeah. students who's teaching in America at the moment, Stuart Hooper, has just asked uh, a great question related to his PhD, I think. Uh, is there any room for cyber WMDs to be included in the GCD? Yeah. Uh, well, let me start with the, with the first question about reform of the UN. Um, because I, I think the debates that we have had uh, since the end of the Cold War and particularly in the context of the, the World Summit in 2005 are pretty stale. Uh, also, when we talk uh, South contribution, they're basically trying to, uh, the basic uh, thrust of those debates are about uh, rebalancing power. Uh, so it's about adding uh, uh, new members to the Security Council, um, perhaps restricting the use of the vetoes uh, in, in some situations. Uh, but this is really minor tinkering, it seems to me, uh, with, the, with the organization. It doesn't seriously deal with the agenda that is in front of us. So it's rather about redistributing power so that it matches better the situation today uh, with a larger inclusion of, of uh, India and Brazil and so on and so forth. Um, if we really want to move on the agenda, uh, not just the... Uh, 
uh, the disarmament agenda, but also uh, climate change and um, and the other important, the pandemic or the other important agendas that are out there. Um, we need to do a bit of what uh, Clark and, and Zone encourage us to do, uh, think through in detail how we can actually design institutions that can uh, deliver on, on these things. Um, it might not be uh, easy to, uh, to get that reform through, it might not happen, um, but um, I think it's, it's, it's completely necessary um, and otherwise we're, we're just wasting our time. Um, I wonder, Laos, if it, I yeah. to sort of pick up on something. Now, you've got the United Nations and its various agencies and bodies, but you've also got a, a large number of emerging powers who are unhappy in some ways or other. Now, mm. China and also some of the BRICS as well, there mm. does appear to be a kind of formation of some other architecture, in, international architecture. I mean, do you think that those through those means there could be pressure brought to bear A, on taking action on certain things, but also B, on the United Nations as a as a system as well. Yeah, of course, they could uh, a competitor could form, right? You could uh, you could have a new organization that would compete with the UN. It's uh, it's probably not likely to happen, uh, but it's uh, it is a, a possibility, a logical possibility. Um, I, I don't see any of those emerging powers moving on that agenda in any uh, substantial way. Um, Perhaps India would be the the country I would expect it most from, but it, it doesn't seem to be forthcoming at the moment. Uh, Brazil has sort of backslided uh, on the progressive agenda, and and China is just going along, to trying to increase its uh, its power. It seems to me, uh, without having a, a big architecture in mind for reforming uh, international relations. Um, but sure, it it, it could happen. Um, but I think uh, the more likely reform path would be um, progressive countries banding together in, in different coalitions. And I'm not just meaning, when I use the word progressive, I'm, just, I'm not just talking about liberal democratic uh, states. I'm, uh, I'm talking about countries who are actually interested in, in dealing with the agendas in front of us. And there, I think progressive coalitions could, uh, could emerge and use the General Assembly as a vehicle to uh, put forward ideas at least um, and and solutions, then they might not be picked up, but uh, at least we we can debate them because the solutions are not being debated by the policymakers. As made clear in this one substantive area, nothing serious has been debated since the 1960s, and that's uh, pretty uh, appalling. Now, uh, cyber warfare is a very uh, interesting issue that uh, obviously also needs to be debated within the context of disarmament. And obviously Clark and Song, they couldn't debate it because it wasn't a thing back then. Uh, and it, it speaks to the issue of uh, how do we define aggression because the institutions that Clark and Song set up were uh, tasked with dealing with aggression. So how do we, how do we define cyber warfare? What, what counts as aggression? And uh, when would the International Peace Force get involved? When would the UN get involved and all of that? Um, and yeah, I would encourage Stuart to uh, to think through that issue. Thank you, um, Karim. You wanted to to come in at this point. I just wanted to, if I could, just add one point that I, you know, I, I just thought of, but I wanted to add to the previous question. Uh, the the question of the global South, you know, always had represented in the sixties and seventies and eighties. Uh, this this notion of, equ of of equity and equitable distribution of resources in one form or the other. So if we push this further and we say, okay, the global south should now represent the, this social equality movement that we see in different countries, that that's really what it represents, and that's somehow what needs to get into the language of the UN reform. I just wanted to add that. Okay, um, Jasmine, there's a question for you, for you from uh, one of our strongest supporters from Brazil, Felipe Larrero from the University of Sao Paulo, who asks, um, how do you evaluate the role played by the passing of Resolution 3379, Zionism as Racism, in terms of the Global South's instrumentalization of the UN and the changing approach by the US to the Israel-Palestine conflict and mm. how it kind of moved away from the UN? How would you uh, evaluate that role of that particular resolution? Yeah, that's a good point. So resolution 3379 was passed in 1975. And obviously you can see how contentious it is. Um, and it follows a series of quite 
uh, you could see more um, strong criticism of Israel in, in the United Nations. I mentioned some of those. I think one that really stands out that ties in with this is the one in 1974. Um, resolution 3246, which was affirming the, the legitimacy of armed resistance by oppressed people in pursuit of the right of self-determination and condemns governments which do not support that right. Um, and then a, a following one in the same year, um, which called for economic sanctions and an arms embargo um, on Israel if it didn't revert back to pre-1967 lines. So those are really sort of strong condemnations against Israel, clearly in favor of the Palestinians, and obviously the one that you mentioned, um, designating Zionism as, as racist. Does that have, I, there's two things I'd say, does that have an impact on the United States moving away from the United Nations? I think it cements it. it, it confirms what they already feel, that the United Nations is now not useful for instrumentalizing, but is an obstruction to their interests. Um, because as I said, I think that move was already made, the, the strategy was already decided after the 1967 war. So to what extent did the Global South members of the United Nations in the General Assembly already recognize that? Um, and so therefore you start having these more sort of desperate calls against Israel. But the second thing to also note is, I mean, it, it, it suggests that um, the United Nations, especially in the General Assembly, shifts based on uh, the dynamics of power. And so just after 1973, actually, it seemed like a high point, again, sort of a restoring of, of the Arab states' power and agency and dignity, right, because they were able to reclaim quite a lot of territory in the 1973 war against Israel, seemed to restore some balance. So was that seen as a moment to to push the boundaries even further against Israel. So it, it's clear that some of that rhetoric follows and, and shifts based on, on where the power seems to sway. Um, so I think, yes, it, it probably would have cemented the idea that the United Nations was not a constructive site um, for realizing their interests for the United States. But I think within the administration, that was a conclusion that they had already made, but it's a good point. Okay, thank you very much, Yasmin. Uh, Laos, there's a question for you here from uh, Dr. Atul Bhardwaj, who's a visiting um, uh, research fellow at City, although based in New Delhi at the moment. He asks that with the Chinese Navy becoming much bigger and stronger, is there likely to be a move towards naval disarmament discussions or agreements at the UN, a little bit of the type that occurred in the early 1920s and perhaps in the later period as well? Yeah, so it's a reference to the Washington uh, Naval Conference in, where is it, uh, 1920 or 22. Um, I, I don't see that. Um, one of the big issues there was uh, was access for the colonial powers, uh, Britain and uh, and France, to their possessions in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and that's obviously not um, an issue uh, anymore. Um, there's also the the sort of wide disparity of power. Uh, so the US is uh, above and beyond um, China and the rest um, of the states in uh, in the world, uh, if we talk uh, aircraft carrier capacity, and also other naval forces. Um, so I don't think it will be uh, become an issue in the in the foreseeable future. Of course, if, um, if the US and the China at, at some point in the future, uh, start to become somewhat level in naval capacities, then uh, then why not? Why why wouldn't they not? Uh, why wouldn't they engage in some kind of arms control conversation? Um, but I don't see it as as a major issue at the moment. I wonder if I ask may I ask each one of you this question, which is that if you were to do a kind of counterfactual exercise, that the UN just didn't happen in 1945. Do you think the world would be today better or worse as a result of the UN not being formed at the end of the Second World War? Laos? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so there, was, there were some alternatives out there, if we also include the League of Nations, right? There was a, the idea of a League of Democracies. Um, and the world might have looked very different um, if uh, if it had only been democracies that were allowed to be members of of that international organization. Um, there was also uh, some who argued for, uh, based on supremacist ideas, uh, for a league of uh, of white states, um, <laughs> including uh, South Africa. Um, 
So that's obviously also uh, an option that was out there and would have had uh, certain consequences. Um, I think if if we disregard the organization for a moment and look at the development of power, um, the US and the Soviet Union, I think um, they would have come to some kind of accommodation during the Cold War and, uh, and after, uh, regardless of whether we had the UN or some other organization. Um, I don't know if that's a realist argument. Um, I mean, there was also the yeah. British, the, the British Commonwealth, or the, or exactly, the, as a kind of major organization. But it is an interesting thing to think, and uh, I think back to 1919 when Antonio Gramsci kind of welcomed Woodrow Wilson to to uh, Italy in a kind of way, and where he said that actually Woodrow Wilson was the greatest achievement of Marxism in American politics. I think it was a hyperbole, of course, but what he was saying was that it is far better to have an international organization where people can talk and discuss and try to resolve disputes in peaceful ways if possible, but that the, the kind of capitalist powers themselves would also use that as a place to clash with their interests and so on. And, and that really socialist internationalism would be the, the step to which capitalist internationalism had brought the world but it was always limited in what it could actually ultimately achieve. But anyhow, I just wondered, maybe uh, Jasmine, would you like to have so, a go? Yeah, it's a good and a difficult, challenging question. Um, I think was it, if we didn't have the UN, would the world be a more peaceful place? Or would, I don't necessarily think so in the sense that it's not the UN that's necessarily been the obstruction to peace it just hasn't necessarily been able to further the cause of peace um, and we've looked at examples where great powers or allies have been able to club together outside of the UN and uh, you know decide on issues regardless of international law anyway and that probably would have just continued to happen but I think the timing is interesting. Um, the timing of both the League of Nations after World War One and the timing of the setting up of the United Nations after, I mean, the League of Nations obviously was um, a disaster, but uh, the fact that it's uh, precisely when you have the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the emergence of new states, even though a lot of those states are effectively colonized, there seems to be this fear, right? What do we do about these new actors on the world stage? Um, it's this no longer legitimate to just suggest they fall under Western mandates. Um, and so therefore, then there's a need for an institutional body with, with claims to um, validating these new states, but it's always going to be in a hier hierarchical setting. And you see a similar issue with the United Nations. This is a period where you have a, a lot of states have been decolonized in the 1940s. Um, what do we do with these states? So if they're left um, to their own accord, would Bandung have become something more substantial, for example, amongst the global South states? Would, would the Arab uh, nationalist states have clubbed together to form more of an effective body without having a lot of their, their policies being redirected to the United Nations? So the timing is interesting because it, it reflects an urgency, I think, amongst um, metropolitan powers to channel the, the newly independent, independent states into a hierarchical system where you they're instituted into a club, but that club is always going to uh, require validation from the, the older member states. Um, so it's the, the idea of burdened membership, which Adam Gottschew talks about, which is always going to be applied to these new states. Um, so I think that the United Nations doesn't prevent peace, but it, it does, um, it does help to maintain this idea of legitimacy coming from the, the great powers. Oh, yeah. And I always think when whenever the US withdraws funding from UNESCO, uh, how progressive actually some of the things that UNESCO does mm. in the world and other agencies as well. So Karim, um, you have the last word. Thank you, that's a, that's a, that's a big responsibility. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to end optimistically and say no. I think I think the UN uh, I think the UN has done a very important job in in this kind of post World War II period, despite my reservations, obviously, and despite you know you mentioned the Commonwealth, and of course uh, you know Mark Mazower and other historians like this have, have basically linked the creation of the idea of the United Nations to British Empire and the Commonwealth, rather than you know it's kind of the League of Nations that is sort of American led order, liberal order. But I, I think, you know, I think of things that um, 
after the Bandung, after the non-aligned movement, the real struggle of the Global South was in the General Assembly. It was through presenting and trying to create a counter movement, a counter order uh, that used the, 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 the majority of the world's population and the member states through the General Assembly at the time in the 60s and 70s and 80s to an extent to try to refashion the international economic and political order that needed something like the General Assembly where all these states, these post-colonial states were able to kind of come together in this moment. Now, neoliberalism and the kind of post-Cold War moment kind of it ended that particular form of resistance from within the system like this. Uh, but you still have leftovers. You still have, for instance, if you look at Palestine, uh, UNRWA, which is the Palestine Refugee Agency. Uh, this, you know, you, you might have heard that, that Donald Trump uh, has, you know, had defunded UNRWA. Uh, they've launched through the Israelis and the Americans tried very hard to try to uh, disband UNRWA as a refugee agency. Not, not so much because of what they're doing on the ground, because I think anybody cares. Uh, the Palestinians do, but I don't think the Americans or others really care, but it's what it represents. That is to say the international acknowledgement and responsibility to deal with refu Palestine refugees and the right of return. So the idea is that this body, this small kind of very important body for refugees is not just something that provides services on the ground, but it stores the, the, the very rights of Palestine refugees to the return. So in this sense, the, the, the idea of international law and the UN when seen kind of counter hegemonically, it does, it is something that can that the weaker side can hold on to symbolically and politically. What what I when my work, what I try to show, unfortunately, is that over these decades, the shift happens very clearly that the UN uh, in, in many instances kind of takes on this war on terror kind of discourse and language, which attaches itself within the Arab Israeli context to the Israeli side, much more so than the Palestine side. So UNRWA and other things are kind of leftovers uh, in this kind of anti-colonial struggles. But I, I, I worry about the tendency, the way in which the UN is headed forward. But, but the short answer is yes, I think it, uh, it did contribute some good things. Fantastic. Thank you, all three of you, so much. Um, Jasmine, uh, Karim, and Laos. Um, and I think, you know, I really enjoyed the three interventions in their own different ways and I think I think with the kind of work that Laos is doing uh, we could interrogate that more in regard to the sort of capacities of the UN uh, much as we have looked at the capacities and incapacities of the UN in, in the Arab Palestine question as well so I think this has sort of achieved the sort of thing that we wanted to create this forum for for the discussion from different perspectives theoretically and so on uh, politically in other ways as well so I want to say thank you very much to all three of you um, to the audience for, for bearing with us as well with our various technical and other issues. Um, we will be, uh, we have recorded this, so we'll be distributing it far and wide as soon as it becomes available. Uh, we will try to do a podcast of it also, which means access in other forums as well, platforms as well. And uh, we also ask that uh, our three speakers prepare um, a few thousand words each of working papers, which we can then create forums uh, about uh, around uh, in order for people to be able to sort of uh, read these papers, but also I think to distribute to our students in our different courses around the world, uh, which again gives um, them access to multiple perspectives on the same issue or the institution, but also gives resources to lecturers who want to try to diversify the curriculum, device, diversify the voices who are analyzing world politics and use those in their classes and try to make it as easy as possible to provide that kind of, um, those kind of voices. So multiple purposes being served. And uh, I think it was really good of you three to make the time. And uh, I wanna thank you. And I want to thank the audience as well, uh, as well as Javaria for everything that she does on this whole program. And of course, Tanya who makes it all hang together uh, technically as well. So we'll be back next week. I think we're talking about Brexit, Modi, Trump, Bolsonaro, uh, British, Brazilian and Indian perspectives on the same. So see you next week, same time, same place. And um, we will um, yeah, have a nice weekend and uh, see you again soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.